Hi everyone, this video is going to be a crash course in double bass playing. In this video, we're going to cover the absolute basics of the upright bass. Everything from buying the instrument to learning the different parts of it and making your first sounds on it and even learning your first pieces of music. Video chapters will be in the description if you'd like to jump around between topics. There's a ton to cover, so let's get started. Buying a good quality beginner instrument that is well set up is probably the most important thing in determining whether or not you will want to continue to play long term. There are beginner options out there that sound awesome and that are very easy to play, and there are some out there that will make you want to tear your hair out. You will probably run into some tempting offers on Amazon or eBay for $500. Do not buy these. I don't consider these bases. These are decorations. These are base-shaped objects. This is a waste of money. More often than not, these will come in conditions that are not playable. I once had a student bring in a new base from eBay, and the bridge was completely flat, making it completely impossible to bow. You'll have to spend a ton of extra money and time getting these things set up, and it can very well ruin your first experience with the instrument. What you want to do is go to a trusted luthier or shop that specializes in string instruments, particularly violins. I would highly recommend the Shen models. These are great beginner instruments. The cheapest option is the Shen 80, which is what I started on, and I was able to use it for years. Now, obviously, higher quality means more expensive. The lowest price Shen that I found on the website was $2,325. This is worth the investment if you're seriously going to play the instrument. If you're unsure and you can't afford to buy one outright, or you're not quite sure if you want to invest this much in a bass yet, most instrument stores will have rental programs. Rent it out for a while and try it and decide whether or not you like it. This might actually be a good idea for everybody. The bass isn't for everybody, and it, it's hard to justify spending that much money on it if you don't like it. I would say if you are going to buy a used instrument, do not do so online. Do it through one of these stores and have a teacher or a trusted musician go with you to make sure that you're getting quality. Secondhand instrument stores and pawn shops can be a real gamble. And remember, even trusted luthiers are interested in making money. You should always have a second opinion before just buying an instrument. Buy the correct size of instrument. Basses are not nearly as standardized as violins are. They come in all different shapes and sizes, and because of this, the sizing system is not always consistent. Most advanced students and professionals play on what is technically considered a three-quarter size. Some bigger people will play on a seven-eighths, and some smaller people will play on a five-eighths. A full-size, true full-size bass is quite rare. If you are a young person or a smaller adult, you will likely need a bass that is under the standard three-quarter size. Here's a chart that will give you a rough idea of what you should be looking for. But again, this is something that you will want a trusted opinion on. Most qualified luthiers will be able to help you with this decision, or will have somebody on their staff or contact list that can help you out with this information. This is another great reason to avoid buying online. You don't ever wanna buy one of these instruments sight unseen. So let's go over the parts of the base. The top is called the scroll and it houses the peg box. The peg box is where the strings connect to the top of the bass. Each string is connected to a specific tuning peg that should not change. These are the tuning pegs. They are used to adjust the tension on the strings, which changes the pitch of them. This thing is called a C extension. It makes the range of the lowest string lower. This is more than likely not going to be installed on a beginner's instrument. The extension is not necessary for playing the bass and the instrument is still great even without it. If one day you are trying to get into a professional orchestra, you can consider having one installed, but don't worry about it for right now. This is called the fingerboard. This is where the left hand presses the strings down to get the various notes. These are the strings from lowest to highest. It's E, A, D, G. This is the bridge. It holds up the strings and transfers the sound that they make into the body. This is the tailpiece. This is where the strings connect to the bottom of the bass. There is a wire that runs down from here around the end pin housing. This is the end pin. This is where the bass sits on. It is adjustable to make your bass different heights. Most end pins will have a rubber stopper on top of the spike. 
always use a rubber stopper unless you have a strap stop or a rock stop. The bass will slip out away from under you while you are playing if it is not secure. And the spike without the rubber can scratch your wooden floors. The parts of the body are the top, the back, and the ribs. On the top we have F holes, which is where the sound is emitted from. On the inside of the bass, we have a label, and we also have the sound post. This is the bow. There are two common types of bow for the bass. The French bow, which is the one I use, and the German bow. The French bow is very similar to a violin bow. It's a little shorter, a little thicker, and a little heavier, but it's held the same way overhand. The German bow is more similar to the bows of an older string family called the Gamba family. This bow has a wider frog and is held underhand. Both are acceptable and there are great players on both kinds of bows. Usually a student will play whatever bow their teacher plays. The one caveat I have for that is that if you are a very small person with short arms, you're probably going to be better off with the French bow than the German bow. But other than that, I would just trust the opinion of your teacher. The parts of the bow are the stick, the hair, the frog, and the screw. The screw is used to tighten the bow hair. The bow needs to be tight enough so that the bow can bounce and that the hair does not touch the stick when playing in the middle of the bow. But the bow must retain its camber or its shape. The bow has a specific shape. If the stick goes straight, or even worse, if it starts bending the opposite way than it's supposed to, that means the hair is way too tight. This can ruin the horse hair and it can potentially snap the stick of the bow. The bow requires rosin to work correctly, which we'll go into more a little later. So, taking the bass out of its case. Now for most instruments, this would not need an explanation, but you decided to play the one that's six feet tall. So, on your bass bag, there should be two zippers. On the right side, it only goes partially up, and then on the left side, it goes all the way up. So start with the base leaning on its left side and undo the first zipper on the right, like that, okay? And we're going to pick the base up like this, all right? We're going to hold it by the back of the case, don't let go. Come down to the bottom and unzip all the way from the bottom to the top. Once we're here, we're going to grab the neck of the base on the inside with our left hand and then use our right hand to pull the bag away. Once the bottom is clear, pull it over the top of the base and set it down. And there you go. One thing you want to avoid is that if you have any metal straps or buckles on your case, you don't want that hitting the wood of the base. So be careful when you pull it off. When putting the base back in the bag, we're going to do the exact same thing in reverse. So we're going to hold the base by the neck with the left hand, bring the case with the right hand. Make sure your straps don't hit anything and bring it up over the top. Okay, move to the side, bring it back around, make sure it's snug, we'll zip up the left side first, hold the back all the way around. And then take your base, place it on its side, zip up the right side. Good. So there are two main postures when playing the bass, sitting and standing. For myself and all my students, I've found that sitting is usually the most effective, but it's important to know how to do both. When sitting, most of the time a normal chair is too short to play the bass on. What we need instead is a bar stool. A stool height between 28 and 30 inches is what I've found to be the most useful. However, you can also buy one of these adjustable stools that goes up and down. These can be useful if you're exceptionally short or very tall. Your left leg is going to be propped up on a yoga block or the rung of the stool. And I apologize for this strange camera angle. Um, and the base is gonna come and lean on your left leg, such as this, okay? Now we want this corner of the base, of the shoulder, to run near your belly button, okay? About like that. To determine the correct height of the base, of the end pin, your eyebrow needs to be close to the height of the nut. It doesn't have to be exact, but it needs to be close. 
And from that height, you should be able to take your bow arm and place it below the fingerboard without having to stretch your strength. The angle where the base is against your body is also important. Too far forward like this means that my right shoulder will be strained when I'm playing on the G string. I have to lift it up really high. And too much in this direction means that I'll be bowing into my own leg when I try to play on the E string. So if you get that corner of the base near your belly button, that should give you a pretty good angle. And remember that this part of the base is resting on my left leg. Now standing with the base. Most of the same principles will apply. We want the correct angle as well as a healthy posture. Take the base out in front of you diagonally and then lean it back and towards you at roughly the same angle it was when you were seated or sitting. Now the exact contact point may change slightly but it should be near the same area. And what we want, we want most of the weight of the instrument to be balanced on your stomach area because if it's not, the only other contact point we have is the left hand. And if you have the left hand holding the base, it can become very difficult to shift. Because of this, when playing with the bow, I almost always recommend sitting. But listen to your teacher on this one. Let's talk about making your first sound on the base. There are two main ways to make sound on the bass. Pizzicato, which means pluck with the fingers, and arco, which means use the bow. To pitz with your fingers, plant your thumb on the edge of the fingerboard, put two fingers on the D string, pull the D string to the side parallel to the fingerboard, and release it. Do that with every string. Make sure that you're releasing parallel to the fingerboard rather than up and down because then you get a sound like this. There are many various kinds of pizzicato that are used based on the style of music that you're playing. If you're curious, look up techniques for orchestral pits, jazz pits, and slap bass. Arco, or with the bow, is when you pull the bow across the strings to make a sound. In order to make a good sound, you need rosin on the bow. Rosin is this sticky, sappy stuff that you put on the bow that help the hair stick to the string. I recommend Pops Rosin, but anything is better than nothing. Let's quickly talk about building your bow hold on the French bow. Um, it's very similar to a cello bow hold, but it is quite different than a violin bow hold. So the first thing we want to do is we're going to put our thumb right here. I know I have a grip on this, but it's right where the frog meets the stick, okay? Our thumb goes right there and it's bent just like that right there, okay? Then after that, the fingers come over top of the stick. Now you have to hold it a lot lower in your hand than you might expect. So these are going to be the contact points. This is where the bow actually touches your hand. As you can see, it touches the tip of my thumb, the first joint on my first finger, that's because I have to extend it out, and then the second joints on all my other fingers. The first finger should extend out a little bit, not too much, but it shouldn't be too closed and clamped together like this. The pinky should be close to the pearl. It doesn't have to be over top of it, but it's a good general place to put your pinky. I like to have my third and my second finger pretty much together and they're very close to the ferrule or where the hair begins. A couple common mistakes I often see is this, first of all, people just straight up grabbing the frog. A lot of beginners do this. Um, another thing that I see a lot is people putting their thumb all the way in the eyelet of the bow. There's like, this is, I believe this is called the Italian bow hold. Um, I don't see many people doing this anymore, but there are people out there that do it. And uh, if you're curious, you could look up a video on that. Um, another issue that I see, especially with people that have played other string instruments before, is they hold the bow up too high and they'll turn it, much like a violinist does. Um, this is good for your wrist action, but the problem is you're not really going to be able to get the amount of weight that you need into the string like this. 
So it's much easier to transfer the weight into the string if you're holding it mostly with a straight wrist and deeper into the hand. For the German bow hold, I've included a link in the description to Bobby Sharman explaining how to hold it. Bobby is a fellow YouTuber and he's also the associate principal bass of the Omaha Symphony. Allow the weight of your arm to fall into the string and drag the bow across an open string. One thing that I like to tell my students is that if you were able to somehow take your arm off and put it on a scale, how much do you think it would weigh? I would guess maybe five to 10 pounds. That amount of weight is more than enough to get a good sound out of the instrument. So you don't need to add any extra muscle pressure, just the natural weight of your arm. The bow must follow a straight path across the string to get an optimal sound. What I like to do is think about following the bridge Notice that the angle required changes for every string that you're on. In the beginning, it's very useful to either record yourself or play in a mirror so you can get feedback because it's a little confusing, the different angle. It looks different when you look down at it as opposed to looking forward at it. There are four factors that you need to consider when making sounds with the bow. The first is rosin, which we already talked about. If you don't have any rosin on at all, you won't get any sound, or you'll get like this ghostly, nasty, nasal kind of sound. The other three factors are weight, speed, and placement. Weight, as I was just kind of explaining, refers to the amount of downward pressure you place on the string. Some pressure is required, but usually enough pressure is generated by the weight of your arm to get the speed, or get the sound that you need, okay? If you overpress, it'll get stuck and it'll sound bad. Speed is the speed at which the bow moves across the string left and right. That would be a slower bow speed. That would be a faster bow speed. And placement. Placement refers to where on the string you're bowing relative to the fingerboard and the bridge. Pick a note on the bass and explore these four different factors and what it takes to get a good sound. Pick any note is fine, I'll do the A on the G string. What did I have to do to do that? I used a medium speed, not much pressure, bowing just below the fingerboard. But if I was to do the same thing right here, I get a terrible noise. So experiment with what exactly you need to do to each note to get a good sound. The exact ratio between these factors is going to be a little different depending on the equipment and the person playing it, but here's a few general tips that should be helpful. In general, the bow has to move slower on the lower strings and faster on the higher strings. As you move up the fingerboard, your bow placement will have to get further and further and further closer to the bridge. When we're playing very high, we need to be almost at the bridge. When playing in first position, the bow placement should be just around the edge of the fingerboard. I have an extension, so it kind of skews that a little bit, but where your fingerboard ends, that's roughly where you want to be when you're playing lower notes. If your bow is new and it has never been rosin before, it's going to require a lot. If it is well broken in, one or two swipes should do the trick. Over rosining is just as bad as under rosining. If you happen to over rosin your bow, you can take a cloth and wipe it off, and that'll help get some of the rosin off and stop it from sticking too much. The next step is tuning your bass. Now that you're able to make a sound, let's make sure that your instrument is actually in tune. So the names of the strings from lowest to highest on your bass is E, A, D, and G. So what you wanna do is download a tuner app on your phone or your iPad, and start tuning these strings one at a time. So open up your tuner app and begin to play one of your open strings. Start with the G string. What you'll see on the screen is you'll have a needle that'll tell you whether or not that pitch was too low, too high, or just right. Now the pegs up here are what determine the pitch of these strings, okay? So if I detune my G string, you'll be able to hear it. And 
and tune it back up. To make the string lower, we turn the peg counterclockwise. To make it higher, we tune it clockwise. Make sure that you adjust your tuning peg slowly. You don't want to overstretch these strings. They're really expensive, and if you stretch them too much, you can ruin them. And there are a couple other ways to tune by using harmonics, but for now, just using the tuner on your open string should serve you well. Um, one pitfall of tuning is be sure that you actually have the correct peg in your hand for the string that you're tuning. Um, bass strings don't break very often, but when they do, it sounds like a gunshot going off and it can be pretty scary. So if you're unsure or if you're tuning a peg and the pitch of the string isn't changing, double check that you're on the right peg. You don't want to break one of these strings. So just as a reminder, this is G, D, A, E, or from this angle, G, D, A, E. Make sure you're tuning the right string. So let's talk a little bit about the left hand. So the right hand, either by pizzicato or arco, is the hand that makes the noise. The left hand is the hand that decides which notes we're going to be playing. Because the string length of the bass is so long, the notes are pretty far apart. If you're familiar with any other string instrument, you're probably used to using all four of your fingers independently. On the bass, in most cases, we don't do this. We use the first finger, the second finger, and then the third and fourth fingers are used together. Each one of these fingers covers a half step on our bass, or if you're thinking of a fretted instrument, each one of our fingers is going to cover one fret. More advanced techniques in thumb position, and sometimes in the lower positions, we use our third finger, but let's for now just focus on this basic hand shape. So there's something I like to tell my students to help them get this hand shape, and it's to think of the bass face. The bass face is just a way to help you get the rough shape of your hand. So what you're going to want to do is take your first finger and stick it right between your eyes. Don't poke yourself in the eye, okay? Then you take your second finger and you put it under your nose, and then you let your third fingers rest underneath that. And we end up with a shape that looks like this, okay? Ideally, we want the distance between this finger and this finger to be the same as this finger and this finger. They should be equally far apart. I know it's a little weird, but it'll help you get the idea. Now let's talk about finding your first notes and marking your bass and learning your first piece of music. So the bass is difficult to play in tune, especially at first. Finding your first notes outside the open strings can be challenging to do without a teacher there to help you out. So having some kind of marking to help you out in the beginning can be very useful. The first thing we're gonna do is find the A on our G string. So the A is going to be a couple inches away from the nut, okay? Maybe about that much. And what you're going to do is you're going to pull your tuner out and you're going to start playing that A. And you're going to adjust the A until it's perfectly in tune with that tuner. Then don't move your finger. You're going to take a pencil and you're going to lightly mark your fingerboard where that A is. Okay? A pencil isn't going to hurt the ebony on your fingerboard. As long as you don't press down too hard, just lightly mark it. Then from there, you're either gonna take a little dot, like those garage sale dots, or you're gonna take uh, fingerboard tape, and you're gonna lay it underneath your strings right where that tape was, okay? And that's gonna be let you find A every time, and then the same note on the lower strings. Now after we have that marking done, we're gonna find our next note. So remembering your bass shape fingering, Put your first finger on where you marked that tape, then put your fourth finger down, okay? This is going to be roughly where your B is. Check that B with the tuner, and make sure it's perfectly in tune, and do the same thing here. Mark it. Then take tape and lay it under the strings right there. So then we will have two markings on our bass, one underneath the A, one underneath the B. When we're playing in this position, this is called the first position, okay? So you'll get G, A, B. On the next string down, it's D, E, F sharp. Next string down, A, B, 
C sharp, next string down, E, F sharp, G sharp. If we move our second finger down to where our first finger is, so our first finger is on the first piece of tape, if we take our second finger and we put it where that first finger was, we're now in what's called half position. Okay, this gets us a new set of notes. So A, I'm sorry, G, A flat, B flat, D, E flat, F, A, B flat, C, E, F, G. Between the half position and the first position, if you learn all the notes in those two positions, you will unlock the first octave and a half of the bass, just between these two positions across all four strings. In the half and the first position, if you master all of that, you'll be able to play every single one octave major and minor scale in some form, and you'll also be able to play several simple songs. So the first song that I want to show you is Three Blind Mice. So we go into our first position, which is where our first finger is on that first piece of tape, fourth finger is on that second piece of tape. From there we're going to think four, one, open. Four, one, open. Oh, 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 one, 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 four, one, open. Try doing it again while saying the names of the notes. B, A, G. B, A, G. G, 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 A, 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 B, A, G. Try it once with the bow. Once you can do this on one string, you can do it on any string. So do the same thing on a different string. After each playing session, it's important that you clean your bass off to stop too much rosin from building up. So we're going to take a, a crappy washcloth and we're going to wipe down our strings. Okay, but make sure you stop just above where the rosin is and turn the washcloth over and wipe the rosin down. You don't want the rosin from the rag getting into the part of the fingerboard and the strings where you normally play, so that's why I like to use two separate sides of the cloth. Then wipe down the body of the base, the bridge and the sides and wherever else needs it. Then I also like to take my bow and wipe off the stick. And then make sure that you loosen your bow. Keeping it tight for too long can warp the bow. Okay? So make sure at the end of every session you loosen this. Sometimes, if we get too much rosin buildup on the strings, we can use a small amount of rubbing alcohol on a rag to help clean them off. We can also do that with the fingerboard. Just use a very small amount and don't let it get onto the varnish of your base because it could eat away the stain of the base. Finding a teacher. So I hope this video was helpful to you, but nothing will replace a highly qualified teacher teaching you in person. The best teacher is usually going to be someone that is already a professional in the genre of music that you are interested in. If someone like that is not available or if their lesson rate is out of your price range, an advanced student in that area would be the next best option. If there is a university or college in your area that has a music program, reach out to the professor of the department and ask them for teacher recommendations. Most of the time, these students are highly qualified, they're good players, and they will offer lessons at a lower rate than the professionals in your area. And most of the time, they're quite desperate for income, so they would be happy to teach you. Luthiers usually also have a qualified teacher list, and they may be able to lead you in the right direction. For Zoom lessons and online courses, they can be very helpful, but in the beginning, I would highly recommend in-person lessons. Also, you do not have to continue doing lessons forever. If you're just playing as a hobby, just take a few to get you started and going in the right direction, and then you can stop. So here's a couple frequently asked questions that I've gotten from students and people that don't play the bass. So one of the first questions I always get is, how do you get that thing in and out of a car? Upton Bass did a great video on this, and I've included that in the description, so check out that video. He shows you how to get it in and out of any size car. If I play electric bass or electric guitar, can I learn the upright bass? Yes, 
Although they are different instruments, they have a lot of things in common. There will still be a lot to learn, but you can think of it as a head start. What's the difference between the bass and the cello? The bass is bigger, it's tuned lower, and uses a different fingering system, and sometimes it serves a different role in the music. However, there are similarities. The posture is similar, the bow hold is similar, and sometimes they serve the same role in the music. Switching from cello to bass is much easier than switching from bass to tuba. How do I carry the bass? Well, I'll show you a quick video demonstration on that as well. So this is another one that probably doesn't need an explanation for any other instrument. But I've seen a lot of people carry this thing in some weird ways. So I think the best way to do this is to grab it right here on the back, have the bridge facing in towards yourself so that it doesn't knock on anything and carry it right here with your wrist straight, okay? I've seen a lot of people do this, and I can imagine that that is absolutely going to destroy your wrist after a little while. When it's in the case, I do the same thing with the straps. And then if you're lucky enough to have one of these, it can be carried up on your shoulder like this. These things are an absolute lifesaver. Definitely use one if you have to carry your bass a long distance. Is the bass fun? In the beginning, it's very challenging, but once you get past those first few baby steps, I think it's the most fun instrument there is. Do I need a teacher? You don't absolutely need a teacher, but I would highly recommend one. You'll make progress exponentially faster, and the better you get, the more you're going to enjoy playing. And the more you enjoy playing, the more likely you are to continue playing. So no, it's not absolutely necessary, but I would recommend it. Thanks for watching. If you found this useful, please consider leaving a like and subscribe. If you have any questions, please leave them down in the comments. If you're interested in a lesson or a coaching session, please send me an email.